Good evening. Once again, it's our privilege to welcome you to the midweek Bible study. We hope and pray as we look into the Word of God, it'll be a blessing and it will help you if you're unsaved to come to Christ. If you are, it'll help you be encouraged as a Christian. If you're in our area, we'd love to have you on Sunday mornings. Come and visit with us. Now, if you have your Bible, we'd ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We're constantly in a series of which we've identified as practical Christianity. Our lesson for tonight will be choose forgiveness over bitterness. Choose forgiveness over bitterness. Father, we ask you to bless the message tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 32. What is the worst sin that a Christian can commit? Murder, adultery, homosexuality, incest? What would it be? Oh, they, although these are awful sins, and many others might be noted, which would be the worst? Well, God's Word makes it clear that from God's perspective, there is no distinction made concerning sin. James tells us that the smallest infraction of God's law is the same as breaking all of God's law. James 2, 10. If you have your Bible, please turn to that. If not, write it down where you can look at it later. Because the fallacy of today, we try to categorize sin. Well, that sin's not as bad, and this sin might not be as bad. According to the Word of God, James 2.10 said, For whosoever <coughs> shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. See, the classification of sin with God is sin is sin, and the wages of sin is death. So from the Lord's viewpoint, sin is sin. But with that in mind, we also need to realize that some sins do have greater consequences to us than others. Jesus told us that if we hate someone in our heart, we're guilty of murder. But no one has been sentenced to death row for hating a person. So, let's rephrase the question. Instead of asking what is the greatest sin that a Christian can commit, we need to ask what is the most destructive sin that a believer can commit. Well, as a pastor, in my experience, now listen to that, in my experience, one of the most destructive of sins in the life of a Christian, from my experience and perspective, has been bitterness, bitterness. And the results and consequence of bitterness has been one that I've witnessed that has destroyed people, families, churches, 
and weren't completely the individual lives that could have been so used for Christ. You see, from Paul's writing, bitterness is an attitude that refuses to forgive offenses. And therefore, it's like a cancer. It grows until it destroys everything around us now let me give you the definition of just what i've been talking about and you need to look at it or write it down hebrews 12 15 I'll repeat it again hebrews 12 15 looking diligently for something that you need to pay extreme close observation to because of the destructive power that it has look at it lest any man fail of the grace of God not fall you can't fall from the grace of God but you can fail of the grace of God you see the effectiveness of bitterness Cuts off the supply of needed grace. Look at it. That's any root of bitterness. What can turn off the flow of the grace of God? Bitterness. Springing up. <coughs> Think about that. Trouble you. And remember what I just said about the destructive power of families, people, churches, individuals. What was that destructive power? Look at the last part of this verse. Thereby, many be defiled. Oh, let me say to you tonight in this study. One of the greatest powers of destructive that I've seen in 50 plus years of ministry and the devastation that it causes that many times becomes irreparable is bitterness. Bitterness. You see, the opposite of bitterness is forgiveness. Forgiveness is that attitude that honestly acknowledges an offense and then dismisses it. Why? On the basis of God's forgivingness of us. You see, the basis that I forgive someone is that God forgave me. Look at it again. Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another. Think about that. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Think about that. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us very plainly that's our purpose. That's our purpose. Very carefully look at it. Bitterness holds on to an offense. But forgiveness brings relief. So the challenge is to choose forgiveness over bitterness. How can we do that? What if the hurt is so deep and the pain is so great? Well, we must understand the basis for forgiveness so we can choose to forgive. You see, the biblical basis of forgiveness, what is it? God forgave us when we did not deserve forgiveness. Romans 5, 8. But God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, many folks believe that only good people will go to heaven, which is totally wrong. Totally wrong. 
Only bad people will go to heaven because there is none good, no, not one. Romans 3.10 We need to understand that we're not forgiven because we deserve to be forgiven. In fact, it's just the opposite. We don't. God forgave us on the basis of His grace, not our works. You see, it's not what I do or do not do that earns God's forgiveness. What is it? We've been declared forgiven by our faith, which is our trust in God's Word. 1 John 1, 9. Look at it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, our forgiveness is based upon God's grace. And because we've experienced that forgiveness, not that we deserved it, then God expects us to share that same same grace with forgiving others. If we could do anything to earn God's forgiveness, then forgiveness would not be a gift, but an obligation or debt that God would owe to us. You see, the application is we're commanded to forgive others even as God has forgiven us. How has, how has He forgiven us when we didn't deserve it? On the basis of grace, not works. You see, the greatest example of forgiveness that we, outside of the forgiveness of God on the cross, would be Joseph. You see, look at it. Family relationship provides a great potential for bitterness. Now listen to me. Listen to me. One of the major problems in the demise of the family today is the failure of forgiving one another. And therefore it grows into that spiritual cancer of bitterness. Look at it. Joseph was Jacob's favored son. He made that very clear. Joseph's brothers were bitter over the way their father treated him. See, jealousy that's not controlled under the power of God will lead to bitterness. Their bitterness grew to develop into action against him. See, they plotted to murder him. But they wound up selling him into slavery. And then the plot grows they went back and told the father that some animal had killed him. You see, bitterness often leads to the destruction of families. I think in a modern time, it's one of the foundations of the demise and destruction of the family. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. You cannot have any imagination how dangerous it is to not have a forgiving spirit. And marriage counseling, when you ask them, what do you think it will take to make sure that this relationship lasts? And of course, it's the foundation of their right or faith in God. Except the Lord build the house, they that labor cannot stand. So they will say, well, it's God's will and our love for each other. Yes. But let me tell you, you know what proved God's love for you is the same proof you need to show each other what? Forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he forgave. That foundation for that couple is going to have to be that same foundation that God has provided them as believers 
For I so love her, for I so love him that I forgive. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, even as believers, there are none of us that are perfect. Paul said that in my flesh or my human nature, there dwells no good thing. And the door that will unlock that bitterness quicker than anything that's at the top of the list is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And you see, you want to forgive to set yourself free, not someone else. Look at it. Look at it. God's work in Joseph's life. The famine came in the land, caused Joseph's brother to come to Egypt in search of food. The man that he had dealt with was none other than Joseph. When Joseph revealed his identity to them, they were frightened at what would happen. But the real thing was, Joseph was ready to forgive his brethren. He recounted to them how that God had brought all things together for good. When his brothers had done what they had done was wrong, but God looked at the wrong and used it to accomplish his will. Look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. But as for you, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass all in this day to save much people alive. Now, how to choose forgiveness over bitterness? Joseph illustrates it. Christ illustrates it. God illustrates it. Notice, acknowledge the hurt. Forgiveness is not the same as denial. Sometimes we try to deny that we're hurt by someone. We may distance ourselves for, from certain individuals and act like nothing has happened. But that isn't forgiveness. Joseph told his brethren, you thought it evil against me. You see, if we do not acknowledge the offense, then we cannot prepare ourselves to forgive. He wanted them to know. You, you, I mean, your desire was evil against me. I mean, you, you, you even originally meant to kill me. And then to destroy me. Don't leave God out of the hurt. Often our first response will be, why did this happen to me? Our focus is on ourselves and the pain we feel over the situation. We need to realize that God is not unaware of what's happening to us. We would consider and ask ourselves, what is God trying to accomplish through this event? Huh? God can take the worst things that happen to us and use them for his eternal purpose in our lives. Go to Romans, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them which are called according to his purpose. Now this verse doesn't mean everything that happens to us will be good. It means that God will use it for good. Good, conforming us to the image of his son. Well, think about it. Can you imagine how different the story would have been had he refused? To forgive his brethren? Think about it. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible said man born to woman, his days is short and full of trouble. We live in a sinful world. We have an arch enemy, Satan. And we ourselves are sinners but saved. There's nobody perfect. There's nobody perfect. You remember when Peter came and asked, how often should I forgive? Seven times. Boy, you can almost hear other people. In other words, Peter was wanting to limit forgiveness. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if we were under limited forgiveness of Almighty God. Remember what Jesus told him? 70 times 70. And that's not 490 times. In the original, that means 
unlimited. Do you know God has unlimited forgiveness to you and I? Well, where'd you get that? First John 1, 9. Do you find a time frame? The only time frame that you might could put with that is if you wait too late and depart out into eternity. And if I read that right, I don't find a limited time. I find an unlimited time. If we confess our sins, now where's the limit? He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that don't mean that we have carte blanche. Well, I'm just going to go out and sin, 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 and, and, and God will forgive me. No, 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 no. That's not a license to get out of the punishment for sin. That's to simply say, I know you're not perfect. God himself says, I remember you're just dust. And I pity you as my children as a father pitieth his children. So it doesn't give us, 1 John 1, 9 doesn't give us a license to just, well, I'll sin here and I'll sin here and I'll sin. No, 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 no. What it does is say that God's forgiveness is not unlimited. I mean, it's unlimited based upon the frailty and carnality of us. You see, sin should not be premeditated. It should only be by foolish decision in that moment of weakness, but it should not be they that are born again do not continue in sin. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me carefully. You see, we have to acknowledge our sins as we receive God's forgiveness. Remember, we're forgiven as we have been forgiven. We need to receive God's forgiveness before we can begin to forgive someone else. You know why a lot of people can't forgive someone else? In reality, they've not forgiven themselves. And see, even when you will not confess your own sins, that begins to ignite that bitterness. And then it begins to be expanded to others. Our willingness to forgive others is an evidence that God has forgiven us. The choice is ours. We can choose to remain bitter over what has happened in our lives or we can choose to forgive. Think what it would be, would have meant if Joseph had chosen bitterness. What about us if we have a spirit of unforgiveness? Are there hurts that we have denied? Onf offenses which we have held on to? Be set free, acknowledge them, release them, begin to experience the freedom that comes from Choosing forgiveness over bitterness. And here's the answer again. 1 John 1, 8, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you be set free today? First of all, confess your sin. And repent of it. Secondly, then confess your unforgiveness for those and accept it today and forgive them and be set free. Lord, we thank you for the teaching of your word today and oh, how that we need to be aware constantly of how destructive bitterness is. Thank God as you've forgiven us, let us forgive others. Bless the lesson and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.